Beautiful, beautiful marriage of maritime and aviation to fly a PBY. Everybody that flew those had a different view of what he was doing. The PBY was a quite a forgiving plane. The PBY is, you know, is a fairly slow, and you get there, and uh, if you're going to fly through a storm, I'll take the PBY. Uh, and it was explained that we're going to be doing mainly night work and uh, they wanted us to be blacked out completely. They put flame arresters on the exhaust so that you couldn't see the exhaust. All lights were blacked out. The cockpit uh, windows were darkened. All we could use in the cockpit for illumination was red light. Our mission was primarily to find any Japanese uh, uh, shipping that we could. During the flights at night, I would be up standing outside on the nose, in the nose, with my helmet and goggles, just looking, you know, for aircraft or submarines. How fast were we going? Maybe 125? Not too fast. Nah, we'd go up to 1,500, 1,800 feet because we'd have to dive down to get. 115 knots on the PBYs with that torpedo that we dropped it to arm it. So we dive down 10 feet off the water and we drop that face right in line towards the ship. And then as soon as it dropped, we just fly right over the top of the ship. We sunk 85,000 tons of shipping there in six months. Um, we've been on 18 hour navigation hops as we call them go out on a 12 to 14 to 18 hour flight. But a plane, the PBY could do that. Right. Uh, mainly the thing is we, we wanted to drop uh, depth charges and uh, also smaller bombs, you know, for damage. So if you have a barge going in with, with supplies and more, more soldiers on it. The blisters were good. We'd make a turn and hold it sideways a little bit and they could get a good shot at everything because it was Kind of stuck way out in the open, and you could they could really shoot pretty well from that, yeah. And there were 50 calibers, which were a good, good gun, yeah. We dropped 750 bombs and a personal bomb, and that could really do a lot of damage. We had bombed that night, and uh, that one bomb dropped out of the front and the back hung up. They have their arming wire here, yeah. and when that pulls out, it's armed, right? Mm -hmm. And that front one had dropped out. We, he tried everything to get rid of it. We couldn't get rid of it. You know, the first tour trying to break things and kill people was not fun. And in fact, we'd sit there in the tent uh, and a briefing before going out and it, it was so weird here you'd have these reserve people you know doctors lawyers and grocery people and what have you and students and you're sitting around trying to figure out how to do the most damage with this next mission and it just didn't make sense it was crazy so the second tour I liked a lot better because here and now we're doing something constructive. We're picking up as many people as we can, Good. find floating in the water and bringing them back. And we were offshore of the island of Bella La Bella, about four miles as I remember, and we saw this flicker of light on the water which disappeared after a few seconds, and, but it was light enough to know that something was down there. We had no idea what it might be. Everybody in the crew said, well, let's give it a try. So we made a landing about two o'clock in the morning on a black moonless night uh, in the open sea and picked up these four men. It was a life raft and these four men had been 
at sea for several days. Christmas Eve, 1944. A PBM had been shot down by a Japanese plane, and this is in the Philippines. And we landed, and they brought these people out in these dugout canoes and put them aboard the airplane. You wouldn't believe the seas at that time. It was uh, probably the swells were higher than this house. And then you had a wind that was probably 75, 80, 90 degrees off of that. But we picked these people up, and to make a long story short, we bounced off a couple of those swells and struggled into the air. The old airplane just chugged away and finally picked up enough speed to keep in the air. With our coast watchers up northern New Guinea on the Secret River, were surrounded by the Japanese. They were captured in the next couple of days, get their heads cut off. So he said, is there any way you can help get them out of there? And that Seafig River, is northern New Guinea, is just like this, you know. And, it, and there are crocodiles in it and logs, and you've got maybe 10, 15 feet on each side of your wingtip when you're going down that channel like this and making the turns. Taxi up the bank and the knees and cover us all up. Pick up 15 or 16 of them and some of their gear and get in the clouds and make 360 degree circles and draw instruments to get up to 9,000 feet. It's about the highest we could get with that weight. And, and in three days, we pulled out 219 coast washers, excuse me, 25,000 pounds a year without a casualty. The first groups went in when they were still under bombardment across the airfield and they flew in in the dark uh, with jeeps lighting up the runway. We were leaving Suva on our way to New Mea and the starboard engine quit and we dropped. Not into the water, but almost. So anyhow, on the way back, searching, here's a convoy. So a plane went, we circled, and the one plane made a run on it. It were only like 1,200 feet, and make a run on that convoy. We got down to like 100 feet, you know, dropped our bombs, hit right just one on one ship, and I think we dropped four bombs at that time. And uh, that we pulled up and and uh, there was a noise in the plane, and here the radio man, he was sitting with his leg like this, looking at the radar, you know, and a shell come through and hit his knee and blew up. So they put him in the bunk, and he had little pieces of shrapnel through parts of him, and just, if he hung, he's gonna stop the bleeding. That was midnight, and we did that till uh, seven o'clock in the morning, our job was to look for the oncoming Tokyo Express. All of us were equipped with equipment called Identification Friend of Four. And uh, the ships read that, and we transmitted it. And yet, after circling in that area, trying to contact them three or four hours, we flew over them at 800 feet and the entire fleet erupted in anti-aircraft and hit us, as you know, and we took a big hit on the right side of the airplane, knocked out the, the starboard engine, dropped the 2,000 pounds of bombs. We didn't know where the wind was. We didn't know what the state of the sea was. There was no moon. We were lucky landed on the top of a swell, bounced a couple of times, came to rest in a cradle between the swells. I would say to students today, get a hold of history, don't lose it, because your fathers and grandfathers uh, gave their lives literally to keep this country free. Just because we did flew in planes that you would think were relics, they weren't relics to us, they were, they were our lifeblood. But they actually did a job to keep America free. So don't lose that. Keep it going. Pass it on to your, your next generation, too. I think it's important to keep history. Don't lose it. So you've got to 
about it. You've got to land along the swell rather than crash into it. We look, sure enough, here's a B-25 with one engine smoking and so. We go down and land, downwind, come on and you're behind all the waves. Where is he at? They wanted me to take it in and land is the best landing. I don't believe everything you read.